Night Terror is something that's been in my mind for like 15 years. And it's just giving me that um, basically I went through like a really crappy situation with my work. I was working doing collections, um, but I had already, uh, I work with a gentleman named Wyatt Lamaru. He's a wonderful actor as well. Um, he's worked with Kat and Michael um, also there. And I just, I've been working bartending with him part-time and that was great. And then I lost that, right? Where I could go in and like, we would work our shifts and of course we'd bust our asses, yeah. but then we would sit, you know, sit and we'd chat about movies and writing and like so even when we weren't writing like that was just like feeding my energy so I also felt like when the COVID lockdown hit like it kind of cut that off for me so I had that like real return of energy that I haven't had in years yeah. and I felt like okay that was gone and then um, basically one of my buddies just built a recording studio in his detached garage Oh, awesome. pre-covid so it was like yeah it was finished like october of 2019 i want to say but it's this great little spot and uh he's the guy that actually did the cinematography on night terror uh, uh, my Col buddy colin, colin? Yeah, colin yeah yeah and uh, so he's like a good friend of mine and when i was like hey i want to go through and make my movie he's like hell yeah like let's do it he was the first one to really get behind me making a movie and like growing up i don't know about you but i was always pushed to you know doctor lawyer businessman you know like something like you know six figures gotta yeah. go for it and so like you know because i'm 35 now it was not even an option to go for like film work and stuff like that so he was one of the first ones to really get behind me and then my buddy brian who was responsible for all the in-camera look of it the lighting he's it's a professional lovely. photographer it's lovely. he's he's really really talented like i give brian full credit for that um but just having them there and having that support go through was i went from a point where i was in a really dark place and so it just it lets me keep going and every time i'm kind of like because i get really tired with stuff that's going on that sort of thing and so i just find that when i'm making film or i'm here talking about film with you like this is literally what i live for yeah and, you know, it's just like, you know, it's like my sales sometimes feel like they don't have enough wind to kind of push me forward. But something like this, I'm like, yes, let's do this. I get not only do I get to play with a little bit of my tech and stuff like that, that I don't always do, but yeah. talking with a fellow film person that knows film and loves film and gets that passion for the look and feel and writing and everything like that is just um, it, I, it's almost impossible to put into words of how much it means and I, but I think you feel ex what you've been describing is exactly yeah. that. I, I couldn't agree more with you because, and especially about the wind in the sails, because I've, we've all had ideas and I've had opportunities to do things in the past. And, you know, we, I, you shouldn't live with regret. And I got offered like really low level work on some big things in the past. And I really regret not taking the opportunity or, being too young yeah. or and like uh, a friend of mine ended up working on band of brothers years ago and he offered me oh um, you should come on board no one knew what band of brothers was i think it was 2000 yeah. when they were when they were producing it in the uk and it would have had would i would have had to quit the part-time job i had to go and do it and it was running work it was working with close with certain members of the cast and then I was just a big regret, big regret. And then I had, I worked on a feature film, a Piers Brosnan feature film. It was a small one, um, but I got offered six months extra post-production assistance because they loved working with me. And I had that regret. And then it kind of, that some of that doubt I had in terms of pushing myself forward fed into some of my later work. And, you know, unfinished product projects we've got, you and I probably have notebooks of ideas we've not finished like a thousand yeah. things and um i'm not sure if you follow my other my like kind of personal instagram account but there's this little project of, of this roman uh, short film i've got going on and that's i'm going to finish i'm going to do that because like you say you know it's about flexing your creative you know muscles and mm -hmm. and i've got you know anamorphic gear i've got the you know black magic stuff all of that and yeah it's sometimes you just need an extra push and the, a friend of mine who's going to shoot that for me with with my stuff 
we kind of were pushing each other the last couple of years or so. Um, he lost his job. Just he, he got a teaching job, a really good teaching job. Oh, nice. Yeah. Three weeks before COVID. And then he got basically <sighs> let go. And then he ended up working for Hermes, which is uh, you know, a delivery company. I'm not sure if Hermes is in the US or uh, Canada, sorry. That's um, okay. But yeah, it's um he he was you know, sl- you know, the hours were crazy. It was one of the, he had to basically he worked in a department where you change the labels if something's not right. And he lost Oof. a bunch of weight, and it's given it's given yeah. him a real amount of focus. And we kind of, he's my best man for my wedding, and we talked about the a few ideas a few weeks ago. And yeah, it's kind of got me jazzed for that. And the festival, starting the festival, has given me focus on my own stuff as well. And uh, this is the first I'll mention this, but um, I think depending on where everyone you know worldwide where isolation is now i know it's really awful in a lot of countries and i know the the vaccine rollout's not so great in canada as well it depends on next year whether the isolation film festival will go ahead that's purely based on is it still relevant that's the big thing is it still relevant so it's yeah. gonna be a tricky decision and you know i've got a lot from it i've met great people like yourself kat michael a lot of great people from Canada and all over the world. And I made some, you know, really long lifelong friends really. Um, so yeah, it's, it's crazy what's happened in the last year in terms of creativity. Mine seems to have gone up and I, mm-hmm. in the start of it in March last year, I thought it'd be the other way. I thought, I, you know, I ended up working at home. I feel very lucky that I could work at home. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's, um, I was all over the place initially, but I've give, been given more focus now. Uh, and some of the ideas are kind of uh, getting to a point now where I can actually do these things and, I, you know, I've got the time to do it. I know I can do it, you know? Yeah. So, you know, it's like peaks and troughs with whether things, short films work out or not. Mm-hmm. Um, because you kind of, you doubt yourself so much, don't you? You know? Oh, my God. Like, uh, that... See, that's one of the things I remember talking with Michael Chan, actually. Michael, uh, one of the first Michael's times... a wonderful guy. Oh, he's like, I absolutely love him and his wife. They're yeah. just beautiful people um, and like really talented actor and like legitimately a good dude. Um, but it was just after he had just put out uh, The Only Asian. Amazing. Uh, which I was just like, I watch it and I'm like, OK, I know I'm doing this like 48 hour film festival thing with you in like two weeks. So I just liked it on his Facebook. I'm like, but. I'm like, I need to pull him aside and just be like, dude. So I pulled him aside. I'm just like, I want you to know, like I saw that. And this was before he started entering film festivals, like the first draft. I'm like, I absolutely loved it. Like adored it. I thought it was such a good job. And it was an interesting conversation because he's like, thank you. That means a lot to me because I have all this doubt. And like, I never thought, you know, I could do this. And I'm just like, man, that sounds like me, but you're super talented. Like you, like this piece is just, a beautiful work and it's just got that little like it's really funny but it's also very poignant and hard-hitting yeah. and topical with that and i just think that that balance is so hard to hit but we all have those doubts and that's where i really found that that hit for me as well because i second guess myself all the time like i just wrote a script for steve kassan and uh katisha shaw hoping to do it it's still like it was only my second draft so i still need to go through it a few more times but you know they just they went through and i got you know one of them liked in the chat but they didn't offer any feedback i'm like oh my god they hated it must be terrible and i'm like okay it's probably not that bad am i saying it's perfect no but it'll go through um and other things though will push it because you did the hellbound film festival as well right yeah um so that was kind of the point where i started uh i was just starting to get involved with some other local film people and that sort of thing talking with cat shaw and i was like okay so i want to do something can i write a part for you she's like absolutely what do you i'm like okay what do you want to play and so she's like you know think about like the worst thing you can think of so i thought about the absolute worst thing i could think of um how dark did your mind go (laughs) mother murdering her son so like dark and i was just like you know what fuck it i'm just gonna make it really dark really bad and i re- wrote through it and she's like oh i love that like it was super dark and then we had other people come on board like uh, a 
guy that just graduated from the director's program at Toronto Film School. So like oh, wow. really good. He was coming on. He's coming on to direct it. The biggest hang up right now is because uh, Kat and Michael are union because they're damn good actors. Uh, Actra is just a nightmare to kind of get through. But that script went from something where I'm like, OK, this is refing. Nobody wants to see it to. OK, I think this is like, honestly, the best thing, at least to this point that I've ever written. And I was ho- we were hoping to get it shot for Hellbound, but it's still in hiatus because we're trying to work around Actra and that becomes yeah. complicated. So is that something that you can elevate the script so union actors can see it? What, how, how do you get it? How do you get it to union actors? How does that work? That literally, most of that is cat, to be honest with you. Um, and that's kind of ballooned out. We have a little community here of really talented uh, filmmakers in the Quarth Lakes region. So I'm part of a Facebook group. And it's basically, we've got actors, directors, we, you know, every level of filmmaker and every everybody in between, even just people that, you know, are like, hey, hey, I want to try this to go through and do this. Uh, so that's one great way that we can connect um, and go through. And I've met a bunch of people like uh, through that, uh, like SJ Riley, and uh, I've met, you know, Victoria Givlin and Michael Chan. And then there's been others, but Kat's been a real driving force because she wants to do like everything. She's super, you know, she's so yes supportive of everyone. It's amazing. Uh, well, that's the entire thing, right? Yeah. And so it really comes down to that. And like I say, the only thing I dislike about working with Kat is that she's union and it's actor, not her, right? So that's, it's not even something about her. It's just, that's the one part where you're like, okay, and I just don't want her to get in trouble either. Yeah, absolutely. Because then you kind of, you don't want to burn her bridges. That's the thing, isn't it? Well, that's exactly it. I mean, I I don't know about you, but I'm assuming you're probably saying like, I'd love to pay everybody, you know, like two grand a a day and do that sort of thing. But it's like when I'm making a movie, man, I have like 500 bucks to like feed everybody. And like, that's it. All other than that, it's what I have or like, you know, one or two little pieces of equipment. And uh, so it's just one of those things. But they're always like she's always willing to work with me on things. And we're always looking for ways to work out funding and that sort of stuff as well that's that's pretty awesome and do you see that is that going to be possible that short film i sometimes i lose hope but we still end up touching base about it because we know because this is something where uh even back in like september we got together on a patio and there's like eight of us that were were, hey we're gonna go do it um Rhonda Mori Costin uh, is uh, a wonderful special effects artist. Like she just did Making Monsters, and she's like, "Yeah, hell yeah, I'm in it to do it." Um, I did change the script around so it's not as heinous as just a mother murdering the son, um, but people do die in it. And she, it's, but it's more of a psychological, her kind of going through the ringer type of thing. Yeah. Um, but no, I'm going to, I definitely want to get that done. I just know that like Kat's got a lot of projects this Sunday. We're going to shoot like a local theater troupe. Oh, awesome. Yeah. They, <laughs> they did a video thing and I'm just like, I turned on the thing and I'm like, oh my God, your skin, you, you are white. Like it's just yeah, overexposed to, yeah. yeah. I'm just like, okay. All right, cool. Like we'll go through. So, you, so you're the kind of person you, I think you we're, we're very similar in one way where, you can see how you can elevate someone's content and video and even just with some simple advice, you kind yeah. of, like I'm the kind of person that the, the, the Roman short film, uh, short film I'm doing is actually a promotional tool for this company that run this um, uh, huge piece of land that's got, uh, it's kind of Roman structures built and there's been a lot of investment in it. And they're actually, the shifting land it's a big big thing and i said uh, all i i'll do it for, completely for nothing as long as i get the short film out of it because i can actually tailor the end so it's more of a promotional tool or a short film and i looked at their previous content they were called roman tours of chester but obviously that's changed quite a lot now and um uh when i saw their previous content I don't want to name names, but I know who's involved. It was yeah. all shot in wide, you know, you you know, because you've got your 
we're a very similar age. I'm, I'm a couple of years older. Yeah. But you know, when you take when you see a holiday photo of someone, and the, the other person's standing fifty yards away from them, and you, you can't see the person, that's not the kind of photo I take. And the content they had produced, I knew I could create something better. And when I develop, when I showed them the storyboards, which are in that book, uh, yeah. I they were really happy. We shot a test. And it's all shot in anamorphics in 240 by one. I was yeah. so happy with it. And they were happy with it. And they've got all the costumes. They've got two horses they can use. They've got a boat. And it was like, oh my God. And they were like, yeah, you can use all of that. And it's not going to cost you anything. Like, holy shit. shit. There's yeah. a massive opportunity here, not just to make a small thing. There's a huge opportunity with relatively no cost. Uh, to make something special for them and for me, the short film. Yeah. And when you go and see a th- theatre troupe, you know what you know what you're going to be able to get. You know how mm. it's going to good, look good for your reel, but you know you're going to create something really awesome for them. Yeah. Well, and that's yeah. exactly it. So, have they got? Uh, did they already have video content out there online? Yeah. Uh, well, Cat sent me the one that they had. I don't think they released it anywhere. Like they also use the internal microphone off of their cameras. And I'm just like, oh, that is one thing that drives me nuts. The number of professional filmmakers that use the internal camera mics. I'm like, yeah, no, just like stop. But yeah, I use, no, it, those I ones... use it for sync. That's the only thing I use it for. Is exactly. Syncing. But but that's that's it. I always record on my internal mic, but that's never the audio that you hear in the final piece. That's always recorded on an external microphone, yeah. even if that's just a boom mic. But like yourself, it just makes syncing and post so much easier to record on the internal mic and then put like, you know, recordings from my Zoom recorder or things like that just right over top of it. Mm, absolutely. Um, so are you gonna I, are you gonna get them to do a piece on stage and then are they gonna be lit by spots? What's you kind of um they're gonna uh I'm going to let them just kind of use the house lights just because I honestly think that their lights are going to be better. But then because I actually know what I'm doing with ISOs, um, my main shooting rig is a C100. So it's got a native ISO of like 800. So it's an extremely bright camera anyways. But I think I've got a 32 stop ND filter, uh, like up to 32 stop ND filter built into the camera itself. Nice, yeah. Might be ND16, but either way I can at least you know, put on the ND filters, make sure it's there, tell them, okay, you know what? Great. We have these lights, like let's bring them down, that sort of thing. Um, I'm also nervous about like just my camp. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to have a shotgun mic on one side, my condenser mic Mm -hmm. on the other. And then I've got the H4N Pro uh, recorder and it's got the built-in internal mic. So I'm just going to run basically four channels and fingers crossed. Yeah. It's, it's very tricky uh, miking a stage especially when it's not like a band mm-hmm. performance where you can hide mics. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'll look forward to see some of that. If, if you ever put it online, that'd be great. Uh, well, so we're just shooting. We're not editing, so I don't know when they'll go through. But uh, just because, yeah, Kat's like, okay, well, we're doing this like on a volunteer. I agreed to do them as a favor. I'm like, okay, cool. She's like, but I didn't agree to do editing. I'm like, all right, fair enough. So we'll just kind of walk through. But yeah, that's yeah. A, that sounds great, man. And it's another it's another way to kind of flex different uh, aspects of your filmmaking as well because in narrative mm. you know you might might be second nature to you but performance I, I really like doing performance stuff especially band uh, you know band pieces um, mm. and yeah. I had an idea for a, a really young band in the, in the northwest of England and the narrative part of it was the canal walk from Clockwork Orange where they're all kind of messing about in slow-mo yeah. and it's kind of really inspired from that uh, by that and I can't wait to do that I know exactly in my head how exactly how it's going to look um, and yeah it's one thing I've realized in the last few years especially in the last year or so when I'm working on my own stuff is storyboarding for me work works for me really really well and then it's a really nice jumping off point when you get inspired on set as well on location um, mm-hmm. So what's, what's your kind of, what was your process for like Night Terror for, for working with Colin? Uh, so working with Colin, part of it was um, honestly really loose because that was the first actual like film piece that any of us had really done. Like I've done a bunch of video work, but I generally do a lot more editing. Um, so that's more where my experience is. Uh, for us, I'm like, okay, I know what 
what we want. And then, um, you know, I wanted to make sure we had side shots. Part of the thing was too, that we built that room. Like that room was empty before we did anything. There's no window on that side. We built the window. It's a cardboard box with lights and that sort of thing. So we had to work out the angles once we had everything kind of built, but I knew, okay, I want to shoot stuff kind of low angle having one where uh and colin was like oh i just got this you know this gimbal and it can do this full 360 rotation sort of like okay we want to get that in um there were some really cool shots that we got as well yeah. we were basically you know we spent eight eight to ten hours filming that bedroom scene of it just so that and we were just like you know what i know i want something from the foot of the bed i want something from the sides and then we had like ones from behind the plant and that sort of thing um, just buried in the corner, which I, I thought turned out pretty, pretty well, but just didn't work with the flow of the film. Mm -hmm. um, so for the most part, I was like, okay, I need, we want this shot. I need this shot. Uh, we're going to go through, I want these kind of angles. And I try to stick to like three angles kind of top so that I'm not having cameras go all over the place. But then we're also like, you know what, let's try out a, you know, few different things as we go. Uh, so I always have a loose storyboard in my head. My biggest thing is I think in pictures. So when I have an idea, and that's part of the reason I have a really hard time describing it because I'm like, I can see it and it's very vivid and detailed. Yeah. And so I'm like, okay, I know exactly how I want it to look, but I'm not always the best at like putting that down and getting somebody. Whereas if I can just grab a camera, it's like, okay, I wanted it there. Um, if you see any of the behind the scenes stuff that we did, you'll see that I'm always, almost always looking at my phone. I'm not trying to be an <laughs> asshole, <laughs> uh, but it's, we, because we've got the shots. mobile. Yeah. Well, it's reference shots, but it's also, I could see the, um, the, like we had, I had a screen, so I was able to actually watch back. So there's one of me and Colin and we're just looking at my phone because we're, I'm watching the playback of what we just shot and yeah. going and I'm like, okay, now I want you just up a little bit. But the nice thing about working with guys like Colin and Brian is that as we kind of go, we're always making like little tweaks and going, okay, you know what, this isn't working so well. So let's, let's flip this around. This is kind of where our limits were. Um, but yeah. So like I say, for me though, I'm about to shoot, I've got two other projects coming up. Um, and uh, both of them are being directed by my buddy Wyatt Katisha is consulting on one uh, with um, Linda Cash. And then she's uh, one of the main stars of the other. Um, they should be both excellent, but I know exactly how I want everything shot. Like, I'm like, I can tell, I can take you through that first 30 seconds of the movie before anybody says anything and i can see it exactly crane shot crane drop down shot i'm gonna have to fudge it and then that means that i'm already know i can't shoot the hallway above a certain level because the roof is right there yeah. but i want to pretend like there's something above it where i can drop drop down a bit but i may have to change that around depending on the like location but generally i have the shot list in my head because i know where that's going but then i'll also have a script that's just okay here it, i want um, this is it horror no 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 it's a more of a drama piece i would say it, to it if it was horror you could always you know if it's got a false ceiling take pop one of the panels like that and yeah. then come down from that from inside um, oh that that's a brilliant idea like that really is, but you know, no, like that, it's you know, like that alien shot in the second one where you see oh, the yeah, yeah. upside down. Uh, but yeah, it's, it might not work, but yeah, it's it's really tricky because sometimes you're really limited by location, you've got this grand idea, and then it's not watering it down. That's when your creativity really takes over, I think, finding yeah. the right what the next option is. Uh, yeah, that, well, that sounds intriguing, yeah. Yeah, well, and it's gonna be it's gonna be a difficult one just because it's in a tight, narrow hallway, and I'm just like, okay, but we've got some like door opening, so I know I can go in and get. Basically, it's gonna be a straight on shot, and then close ups of each of the two actresses from either angle, and that's really all we're gonna be able to do. Maybe move from like a you know a two thirds shot to like you know something like a medium shot mm -hmm. of them. But I already know I'm like, okay, there's a point where she like takes that drag on the cigarette. I'm like, I want a really low depth of field shot where I've just got the cherry of that cigarette lighting up and you can, you can just barely see her and maybe a little smoke in the background as she's taking that drag. Yeah. And you know, like I, like I say, I see certain shots, but it's also going to be, but most of it, it takes place in this. It's one location. So mm -hmm. I want everything shot really tight to give that like kind of claustrophobic type of, 
feeling like they're, you're trapped along with them. But again, it's more of a drama than a horror film. So I don't want it to be like horrific, yeah. but just they're tense. And so I want that to be reflected in the shots as well. I was, um, before we started, I was watching uh, watching Point Break. And when Ke- when Keanu Reeves turns up at the, the FBI, um, it's not police station, it's S- um, FBI kind of office for the first time. Everything's really tight around him. And I love the kind of the language of what's going on and how they use the camera. So yeah, it's it's super important. And it, I, I kind of like I like working with the limitations myself as well. So I think that something like a, a cigarette, you know, the end of a cigarette could be if you've got a, a macro function on a camera that could be that could maybe possibly work. Um, yeah. I've always wanted to try one of those. Um, is it? Uh, I don't know the brand starts with an L. It's that macro lens that's like this long, it's really thin. Um, oh, I know which one you're talking Huawei about, or something like that. Yeah, it's really super thin, but it's like the ultra close up shots that they get with them are insane. Uh, I've always, I just want one. I'm gonna use it <laughs> once a year for one shot, you know? Yeah, and it's really expensive. So, I because <laughs> we all have those, we have exactly how we're going to use things but it's going to cost yeah. you an x amount of money to execute that idea you know yeah well and that's the thing and i don't know about their like rentals here for lenses are fairly impractical unless you go into toronto yeah to me which is a two-hour drive each way from me so you know to, by the time i rent a lens for you know three days i'm probably looking three to four hundred bucks and i'm like okay but if the lens is going to cost me a thousand you know, it just makes more sense to, if I can, to spend the thousand than, you know, spending out 300 and then doing another 300 or 400 bucks. And then, cause right there, that's, you know, two thirds of the lens cost. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Right off. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, that's one of the reasons that I bought um, anamorphic, uh, anamorphos 52 times so I could shoot and get those. Cause I wanted the kind of slightly old seventies, eighties look to, what I wanted to produce and you know a 40 mil lens really is a 20 mil as well um, mm-hmm. the way it works so I've almost looked at doing any of this content with an anamorphic system but then I'm like no it doesn't yeah. work it looks ridiculous you know you'll see the flaws in this room um, yeah but when you when you get those opportunities to use the gear to use uh, gimbals and cranes and all sorts and execute the kind of shot you're looking for it's fa- it's a great feeling isn't it oh it's amazing like night terror really came out of my head and onto the screen you know there are little things um that i would have probably changed but we didn't have a lot of options to go back and reshoot just because of some other factors um but it was very very close to what i wanted uh with it and you just made me think of something did you end up watching the lighthouse with um yeah oh my god yeah robert Powers? I I watched that with a, a buddy and like I just the cinematography in that one I'm like the movie itself I'm like it is so weird and out there but I like I kind of love that but the cinematography on that thing I was just blown away by it and they did they had that old school look and even as we we're watching I'm like this looks like it was shot like there's elements from like, like okay, 20s, this looks 20s or 30s some of it like if you yeah. look at uh the original Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in terms of the way they light, light the faces and the really hard yeah. contrasts and the pools of shadows. And, oh, yeah, I got obsessed with, uh, especially The Lighthouse and a few others the uh, last couple of years, where I, I, I have to know how they did that. I'm not trying to mimic it. I just want to know what their process yeah. was because, because you know, from looking online, that's, that's a, um, a great achievement in cinematography, that film. Oh my God. It was stunning. Um, there, I did find something, we did find something behind the scenes and they're talking about how, you know, they had, because they're doing, um, is it the anamorphic widescreen there where you actually compress it down and then, uh, elongate it. They actually had to build the furniture in the kitchen differently so that they could shoot it properly. So it looked, it didn't look all screwed up on screen. I was like, that is just fascinating but they used that combination of digital and then they had cameras from like the 20s and 30s and literally it was something yeah. where you know they're talking about the budgets and i'm like man i have like 500 to a thousand dollars to shoot and they're like yeah one of the like rolls of film costs us like 500 bucks or something like it was just insane i'm just going no yeah. like 
Yeah, but and it's then, also and then if it's not processed right and you spend that budget, it's just gone, isn't it? Gone. Yeah, and I'm just like, no, you know what? I'm I am so I don't think I've got the nerves <laughs> to work on something where it's like, hey, this shot is going to cost us $2 million to do. I'm just like, nope, nope, nope. Like, give yeah. me Kevin Smith budgets and I'll go. Yeah. I remember Arnie when he, um, Arnie funded the tank chase in Terminator Genesis. Is it Terminator Genesis? No, T- Terminator 3, Rise of the Machines. Okay. Uh, it went over budget, but Arnie said, no, we need this. And he ended up paying for that sequence, which cost millions. And it is, it's a, it's a pretty bad film, but um, that sequence is really quite special. But, you know, it was, it was millions. Like, look at the motorway they built in The Matrix Reloaded, millions. Oh, and yeah. With, with um, what The Mandalorian's doing and what Alex Proyas did with iRobot in terms of the virtual sets, that's that's something. It's getting to a point now where, you know, it takes it takes a, it takes years to kind of drip down to the likes of Oz and, and many other uh, micro budget filmmakers. But it's positive to see that these things are achievable and not having to spend millions. Like mm-hmm. I would love to shoot with real anamorphic lenses, but the rentals, like you're saying, it's the same here. It's it, Manchester is a is quite close to here. And that's where a lot of TV and a lot of production happens, especially the BBC's moved up here and that kind of thing. So it's, but the rentals are extortionate. And that's why I bought the anamorphic. It wasn't cheap. It really was mm-hmm. expensive uh, for what it was, especially with like Siru lenses now. I think it's Siru, I think as they pronounce it. But with that, they were only 235. I wanted something that had a bit more flair and character. Um, so yeah, there's always trade-offs, but there's definitely always ways, uh, not ways around it, but there's other options. And I think, you know, you end up being really happy with, you know. Oh, uh, like the amount of technology we have at our fingertips right now is insane. Like I say, like I'm using an M50 right now as my webcam and it can do like 4k. I spend 40, 50 bucks on an adapter so I can use EF and EFS lenses on it. Yeah. I just bought a uh, speed booster as well for it, which means that it won't turn it into a full frame camera, but the crop factor goes from 1.6 to 1.13. And I'm like, that, that's okay. almost, almost full frame. Well, that's it. And I'm like, and, but film's never been a full frame medium anyways with the super 35. So I'm like, I don't care about shooting in crop. I just want to make sure stuff looks good. But if I can do, you know, 4k 24 frames per second, all said now with like lenses and everything, I'm under a thousand Canadian. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's crazy to me that that's the price that I can get in on and I can do films that will look as good as some of the professionally shot ones. They won't be as involved, but you know, between like premier pro, the amount of stuff that you can do on there and you know, any other software that goes through the lens capabilities, um, the new generation of lenses too, like Rokinon and um, the other names are eluding me right at this moment, but they've got a couple uh, of the other ones that are like that, uh, where it's like, you know, 500 bucks Canadian. So, you know, it'd be about 300 pounds gets you, you know, these great 85 mil, you know, cinema lenses with the full focus gears and yeah. you're just, and the, I mean, they're all manual focus, but for me, um, I've always been somebody that's tried to stick to manual focus as much as possible. It gives you a greater understanding as well of what's going on, I think. Well, that's it. And you don't have to worry about, oh, chipmunk in the background, focus goes here. Oh, focus pull over here. Um, I do like having, because I've got the dual pixel autofocus on this one and uh, as well on the C100. I love it if I've got a moving like gimbal shot or something like that. But even then, as long as I can like kind of rehearse it with the actors and go through, I would rather have a set focal because then it's just you just have to pace it properly yeah. and you don't have those certain I hiccups find that come. You can kind of ramp, not, not ramp into focus, but I like being able to pop in and out of focus and have it. It feels a lot more organic, doesn't it? Oh, 100 percent. I love I love a good focus poll too, yeah. where you're just like, okay, you know, we're having a conversation on two sides of the room and you just 
you know, you can have one person in focus, the other person out of focus and maybe shift the focus between whoever's talking, but then maybe that last line is delivered with that person out of focus as they're kind of like leaving the room. It's just like I say, everything for me that I see on screen means something. So having that, you know, ability to mess with depth of field and get those types of things are really important because it just adds that color clarity and for me, when I put something on to screen, I'm trying to get as much information as possible um, into each of those. You know, they say a picture's worth a thousand words. I fully believe that. And we get 24 pictures a second yeah. to work with. So, you know, we're doing 24,000 words a second. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely, I can see it's definitely a passion and it's, it's more than, it's the same for me, man. It's, it's something I'll always continue to do, and I don't know at what level. Um, there's something in particular I want to ask you about. Um, you were saying there was no windows in that room in Night Terror. Um, yes. So what was your – because I shot something years ago, and I'll I'll try and find, find it. I'll send you a link for it. It's called uh, Hypnagogue. Uh, it's about, um, uh, like, you know, when you wake up and you're tense and you think so, there's, like, weight on your body. Yeah. It's a short film I did a few years ago. Uh, and – the the blind shot you know the the shot of the blinds that are kind of streaming across the back yeah. wall how did you what was your kind of little what was the setup for that so that was brian's idea to get through i'm like okay i know we need to do it so there's a small it's basically we're in a basement mm -hmm. so there was a small small window like it would have been like that big but not enough that you would have been able to get that and i really wanted the that moonlight to kind of be coming in so what we ended up doing is um, we've got a uh, Brian had a couple of the Yong Nuo uh, light wands, uh, the Yong Nuo three pro something like that. Yeah. Um, I have the the version two, which has the replaceable battery uh, in it because of, of working with him. I'm like, they're fantastic. Uh, but what we did was we took a, a cardboard box just with the open face here. We cut little holes in it, ran the lights, the two light bars through it. And then we put a pair of Venetian blinds in front of it and then just made sure that we could angle it right so that that, move, that light was coming in. And we just made sure that it was always that, you know, just keep the light source in that yeah. same single place. Because the, the key thing with that, it's almost like a dream sequence in itself. And you just need to give an impression of a window. That was That's the mm -hmm. brilliance of it. That's all you really need for an audience to kind of understand the space. And well, the, ge the yeah. geography of the space, you know. And did you use mm -hmm. any kind of like black pro mist or anything like that? On the yeah, we we shot on the uh, one half. I've got the one quarter. Colin's got the one half. Uh, so we use that just to soften up the lights a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we shot with a polarizer on that one. Uh, everything was handheld as well. Just I wanted to get that little bit. First of all, Colin loves shooting on the gimbal, which is awesome. But I also love the fact that even though it's really steady, it still gives you that handheld feel, which I yeah. find just adds to that like tension and unease for it. Um, I did want to shoot a little bit tighter when we did the the hell sequences. Um, I really wanted it to be a little bit tighter um, because they're great. They're really great. Oh, and again, that was the working with Brian in terms of lighting. Caitlin, uh, who starred in it my God, like I can't speak highly enough of that woman for the things that she let us do to her. Yeah. Um, she was such a trooper, like that, that's I, I know that I know the, sh I know the shot without ruining it for anyone that hasn't seen it. Yeah. But I, I know those, those cuts you're going to with her and like, wow, they've, she's done a great job there. There's a lot of trust there. <laughs> well, Oh, a hundred percent. She was all in for everything. And, um, you know, I can't say it, thank you enough to all three of them, uh, you know, and uh, we recorded the entire thing at Colin's place. So between him and his partner, uh, Ree, uh, you know, and uh, Caitlin and Brian, they really helped it go through because Caitlin was just like, like, hey, can you do this? She's like, OK, that that was the thing. We literally dumped buckets. Well, I want to say buckets, but like a liter and a half, two liters of corn syrup over her yeah. at points. And like, it's in her hair, it's everywhere. And she's just like, yeah, okay, cool. Like, and, and it was cold. And there were just times where you could tell she was cold and it was just, we, so we tried to work as quickly as possible. Um, but she was phenomenal for that. Mm -hmm. 
I think the other thing that we did too that uh, just for the be- the nighttime bedroom scene is we used a hazer to really make sure that there's some atmosphere in there as well. Yeah, it looks um, really good, man. Yeah. Yeah, so that that was always a fun part because me and Brian would start using the hazer and it would just like go in and we'd have to be like, okay, two minute break while the, the smoke all kind of like settles down. But uh, yeah, yeah, that that was the big one for it. Yeah, that worked, worked well. And uh, it wasn't like I was looking for how you made the film, but it felt the, the language and the way you work with Colin, I think worked really, really well. And those close-up shots, especially with the the sweat on the back and I love that it's almost like somewhat something was going to break through a back I thought it was yeah a Ridley Scott film though that particular shot I thought something was gonna and it was yeah it was really good use of uh, camera work and yeah I really really enjoyed those shots in particular um were the were the without spoiling for this the spl- uh, fl- I was gonna say splashback then that's a kitchen thing uh, yeah with the flashback shots <laughs> um were they were any of those stock or did you shoot all of that no uh, any of the like the flashback shots were stock just because again i'm on a micro budget but yeah, one of the things made sense yeah yeah well on the library i was okay so there's one of the kids and the last one of the kids i was glad that i found it because i'm like okay it works it works really well but the downside to it was that I had to cut it early because they're all smiling and laughing. And I'm like, okay, this can't, they can't be smiling and laughing. They're not excited or happy that these events have come to, yeah. to pass there. So it uh, was one of those things where I'm like, okay, they'll go through. That was that entire sequence though, the flashbacks was something that I did because of feedback that I, I got through it where you'd have a few people that would understand the entire thing's based on my anxiety from it. Like that's where everything stems from internally. Um, I wanted to use a, a female just because of the way that society constructs things. First of all, kind anything of, to do with kind of uh, perceived vulnerability. It, well, exactly for that. And which I don't think is necessarily fair, but that's kind of the way that it is. It's the same reason that it was really important to me that at least she appeared to be nude in bed. I, I didn't want anything graphic. Like she's she's clothed at all times. We just use camera angles for it. Uh, very um, clever, yeah. Really well done with that, yeah. Yeah, so, but again, it was that vulnerability. Of, like there is nothing between her and her thoughts, you know, and she is exposed to everything. And when you say, you know, it's like something is trying to come out, like that's exactly what it is where she's fighting with this inside her. And again, try not to go into like spoiler territory there, but it's it's a battle and it's an ongoing battle. And uh, the initial cut that I'd done, um, I ended up actually, we have one scream in it and I was really dedicated getting that to the right screen. Mm. And so I added on a bunch of different layers, but I wasn't able to get quite the right screen that I wanted and find it. So I'd layered on like some um, more monstrous effects and unfortunately, it I think that confused a, a few people at least that thought, okay, is she the monster? I'm like, no, she she herself is not the monster. So is working stuff with that. And again, I don't know if that's too spoilery with it, but uh, yeah, that was also one of those things where just so I worked in that that backstory so that people could understand that there's something. It doesn't have to be that exact situation but we've all got some situation or a lot of us do that we're struggling with and you know it it yeah. haunts us yeah i think uh i think you all as a, as a team and i think it worked really well i really enjoyed it and uh i think everyone else that sees it um because i think you might know that on the 26th of june that's when we're showcasing all the official selections uh, so anyone that's been officially selected and we're posting more of those little videos the little montage yeah. videos um when I got the time to post them, because <laughs> you know what it's like with work and everything else. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a play. It was a like, I when I put your clip together, I almost wanted to show the whole sequence, and it was really difficult because the editing's really good. It really, really is, especially that sequence in particular. And yeah, it was really fun to do because that's the that's half the fun of uh, curating um, really interesting content is you get to see some brilliant stuff and uh, and you never want to kind of 
pull something apart or put two, you know, two or three things together and it not look good. And I want to don't want to ever misrepresent the film. Um, so yeah, I think you, I think you did a sterling job, and it was, yeah, I think you, you're showing your strengths, especially the, you know, the trusting Colin you had with your editing skills as well. It's all evident in the film, um, and it's going to be fun. It's the the most difficult thing I have to do in the next few weeks when I have to put the um, or, the showcase order together because I can't put something called. I don't. There's there's a there's a film about ducks, animated ducks. It's really simple, but really well made. And then I don't. Brilliant. Want, and then putting it against something that's really really graphic. Like there's a few really graphic films. Um, it's going to be really interesting to get that right. <laughs> you know that balance. So oh that, yeah. That editing process and the order. It's like an assembly edit, like a mega mm-hmm. assembly edit, and it's going to be. That's going to be crazy. It's going to take some thinking time to do that because you know the score. The amount of thinking time you spend on any project is crazy, isn't it? Oh, my God. It was there. And first of all, I just want to say thank you very much for those compliments. They absolutely mean the world uh, to me. So just wanted to start by well thanking you for yeah. that. Mm-hmm. And I love the little teaser trailer that you put together with it. I thought you did such a great job of picking pieces. And I'm like, okay, I'm not I like I'm excited to be in the festival but i'm excited to attend and watch all these films like yours like this animated duck thing like oh it's kind of simple i'm like it sounds great like yeah let's get that stuff in and, i um, uh, I, sh- I showed uh, uh Flo um a short film and uh yesterday i might show you one of them in a sec because that's the only time we show some of the films obviously already available on youtube that kind of thing and but i kind of like keeping it oh, we're not going to show everything together. It's more about the collective thing. Mm-hmm. So I might show you one, one of them in a sec. Uh, we showed Flo this film about called The Thread, and it was about this thread this guy finds in his jumper. And where it goes, story-wise, it's one location in front of a mirror in a bathroom, and it's uh, just under three minutes, and it's really... In terms of shot selection, that was like, wow, the, the choices he made are, are really, really great. Uh, and I would say the same thing. I would say the same thing about almost every film we've received. We, we've actually had to reject some um, because uh, they broke certain rules that we didn't like and where they went. And we'll never kind of publicize what they were just out of respect of for the filmmakers as well. And one of the rules was we didn't want vertical videos because we had some last year. And for me, I know like you've got like Zack Schneider and his, you know, cropping a square in 133 by one or whatever. Uh, it's really, it was really difficult decision in some ways because that's way, that, you know, some, there's a lot of good experimental films that are that aspect ratio, but I, thought, I just can't accept that. It's just for me in terms of standards, I can't, I can't accept that. So yeah, yeah there, there were some um, decisions we had to make. And yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's really good fun putting this together. It really, really is. And um, would you be looking to submit to Hellbound this year if 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 you make something? Oh hell yes uh, to that. Uh, like I said, that was a big driving factor. Is just knowing that that was out there. Yeah. Um, I'm actually, like I said, I'm filming something. Like Kat and I are working together on that theater project this weekend, and it's something I want to bring up with her to just talk about and see what we can do to get it made um she's put in she's already put in a tremendous amount of work like the 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 crew that we've got together for that and we're hitting the right time of year so it's just by the time we got stuff kind of ready to go it hit point here where it was just it's too cold to go through it's too cold for the equipment it's too cold for people and just in general but we've got great location scouting already done um so I'm really hopeful that we can have that one uh, done and up. I don't have too many other horror films in the pipeline right now, but that being said, if we can't get that done, I would like to get something put together. Um, yeah. Even if it's like I said to you, um, a few, I think a few days ago about, we're really happy to put uh, behind the scenes photos together and publicize and support filmmakers that way as well. And, we did that with a, a French uh, film crew and that was, they were making six films together as a collective 
and they were i think they're all going to end up submitting so we've had one submission from that group already and the rest are going to submit as well um but yeah we're we're happy to support content in many ways like even today with henry tran and nightingale you might know i'm not sure if you know those guys from canada but they were talking about they worked on a, a project it's on billboards in toronto as well about um, anxiety and mental health and how important it is to be aware of your own state of mind especially the last year and mm -hmm. i said to henry yeah I'm, I'm can i post this i'm really happy to repost it it's not about the festival it's more this is more important so yeah mm -hmm. if there's ever anything you want to us to myself to support i'm very happy to do that especially for um especially for horror <laughs> that's that's my <laughs> job as you can tell by yeah. these things here so well, um, which is yeah and that's awesome but i think that that's what i think that's what initially drew me to horror as a kid anyways yeah. was it was that mental health aspect because for me there's a lot of things uh, like you know i've got a bad case of anxiety and uh, some you know mild depressive disorder etc and some other stuff but that idea of horror where you know either somebody comes out of it you know they struggle they go through and then they come out but i also like the ones that don't necessarily end well um like one of my favorites is house of a thousand corpses mm. i absolutely love how zombie shot that that kind of like almost 70s you know uh i don't want to call it like a snuff film but you, you know they had those ones like you know i spit on your grave and things like that i just love them because they're different they're out there and again that visceral energy doesn't it oh uh, completely and for me it just it helps me to feed like my mental uh and you know my mental mental energy and get me into a better state which may seem counterintuitive to people that don't get horror films mm. uh, but it's just something about it where you're just like okay this is absolutely amazing i just love the fact that it's there i love a film that can scare the pants off me which has been very very rare um but I'd much rather have something that doesn't scare the pants off of me, but has an interesting story than a lot of the cliched ones. So that we get to where I'm just like, if it's a yeah. bad B movie, I'm all for it. But when it's just like, uh, it's just it's missing something in that story. Yeah. I think there's my, yeah, I totally agree with that. And I just remember um, uh, I went to see a film called about, uh, about Schmidt with uh, Jack yeah. Nicholson. And the, the opening scene, he loses his wife and it's about the road trip. And the scene where he loses his wife, it really like blew the doors open to my own mortality at that point. And that terrified the shit out of me, you know, and we always have peaks and troughs. And there's a, there's a really great, I think it's a really great, I really enjoyed this film, but in Star Trek Generations where Malcolm McDowell's character Picard are talking about death being a companion or death being a predator, it's that understanding that and and trying finding a zen place with that is uh is is if you do that early enough i think you can have a, a healthier brighter life you know and you're happy mm -hmm. when i saw that film <laughs> i opened it was like holy shit that person's on his fucking own now that's more scary to me than so many other things you know uh, i agree 100 percent. because yeah. it's so difficult especially in horror to really affect me because you and i both understand how production works there's that small element and then there's then there's really weak execution of ideas and you know like for me like mm -hmm. saw didn't scare me i just i'm i yeah. like horror i i can watch you know if, if torture makes sense in a film i'll watch it but yeah things like i was a huge fan of saw and i came out really kind of not liking body horror and for me, I'm not sure how you how you feel about this film, but Green Inferno, have you seen that? I don't think I've seen Green Inferno. It's, uh, Eli, is it Ellie Roth or Eli Roth? Oh, Eli Roth, yeah. About coming across this tribe in, I don't know where the tribe is, in the middle of the Amazon jungle. And it is purely just about body horror and chopping limbs off and all sorts of stuff. And uh, it, it's really, yeah not into that not into that yeah and you know you you and i our senses are deadened by watching so much and when i was a when i was a child and i watched a child's play the reason it was so effective is because there was a, a child in the uk called jamie bulger 
that was led onto train tracks by two young kids that were like eight or nine, taken away from his mother, and they killed him. And they blamed watching Child's Play on the on for for the what they did. And because I was their age when that happened, that was fucking scary, you know. And now it's oh, yeah. it's it's the it's, it's you know there's things like CG. Like if you watch something like uh, Tony Scott's The Hunger, it, there's like okay. there's elements of what I like about your film in that, in terms of the kind of dreamlike uh, moments that are really, really, really scary. And I think so much of that is lost now. Oh, very much so. Like I think the last one that really horrified me was Hereditary. Oh, that's and great. it was that. I love that. Yeah. Th- like no, it was really good, but I had to stop watching it because of that scene in the car. And I was just like, as soon as it hit, I'm like, okay, that hit me. It didn't scare me. It was just like, okay, you know what? I need to take a break because it hit me really, really hard with that. Uh, like it is a brilliant film, as is uh, their follow up yeah. Midsummer. It, like again, very weird and going through, but that was the thing that really hit me hard i just was like okay i need to take just a personal break to to deal with what i just saw there yeah um and come back to it later but i'm yeah, also not a big um, like the idea of killing your sister do you know like into because it's the brother yeah. that's driving the car right that's right yeah and spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it you've got to go check it out now um it is i thought from the marketing and it's very clever like is it Ari Aster, isn't it uh, they did both. I believe and so, yeah. I thought the horror and the scares were going to come from the young girl. And the way it's the way that sh- film is shot with the dioramas and the house, and ju- I yeah. think it should have been nominated for a best cinematography Oscar. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. Um, yeah, that is, that is a really horrific moment because I felt for the brother. I was like, exactly. I was just I was devastated for that brother, and it was really. I, I had that moment in the cinema going, oh, Jesus, right, okay. Um, not me for six. And, you know, I, there's there's some great, great moments. And, like, the the ending and the crown and what that meant, I was like, oh, my God, I've not seen this before. I loved so much of it. And Tony Collette is is a brilliant actress. Absolutely oh my God. brilliant. And the whole thing with bash, bashing your head on the, uh, the loft door. And- <laughs> yeah. It's yeah, it's uh, a wonderful film. Well, you expl- I couldn't agree with you more on all the parts that like I hadn't. I like something that's new that I haven't seen before. Um, yeah. Like I said, I don't mind that that scene hit me hard. I think it should if you're a person hit you Absolutely. hard, and that's the point of having a scene like that. It wasn't like you're supposed to like okay, now I'm gonna go sip some tea and everything's fine. <laughs> it's supposed to hit you like really hard. Yeah. Uh, and Tony Collette is just this phenomenal actress, you know, whether it's Little Miss Sunshine, it's Hereditary, um, you know, even The Sixth Sense, where I feel like I'm really tired now of uh, M. Night Shyamalan's movies because it's just like, okay, what's the twist coming now? Yeah. But twists are another thing, actually, that really can bother me is there are good twists and there are bad twists. There are twists that are just like, I'm just going to completely just change this and do it. But then there's changes or twists that are built in. And if you really pay attention, you can pick up on them earlier Mm. that go. And I really love those twists where you go back and you watch it a second time. You're like, Oh, I see this. Oh, I see this here. And this is going through, or you're going, okay, there's this little bit of allegory or, Oh, you know what? That, that symbol now. Okay. It's right there. I didn't see that before, but now that I've watched the entire thing, it's sticking out like a sore thumb. Yeah, absolutely. Love. There's, um, uh, have you seen Hellraiser? years ago yeah yeah so uh, that time. was that so when i interviewed cat for uh, watching uh, which she submitted last year mm-hmm. uh she was telling me about her dad showing her hellraiser when she was really young and that's hilarious to me and when you watch the film i, I i've watched it so many times and i absolutely love it a bit really really yeah. love it um, because it's such a, oh, it's just beautifully crafted the music, Clive Barker's writing, everything about yeah. it. And uh, there's a there's a, uh, a film theory, I can't remember the guy's name, film theory guy that uh, talks about films. And sometimes I don't fully, you know, 
because I sometimes I like being a surf, understanding things to a certain degree. But if I if I look into how it's produced and then watch it or something and fully understand too much, the magic of what I'm seeing is kind of lost on me. But when I watched Hellraiser, and I've watched it, I don't know how many times now because it's it's so grim, but for the for all the right reasons. And then there's this whole thing about flowers and life and birth. And in the stained glass, in the stained glass around the house and the door, there's the rose again. And I didn't see that until like the fifteenth time of seeing it, you know. And yeah. I love that. And like, it's like watching LA Confidential. I, I it's a masterpiece. It's a real masterpiece, especially of writing. Yeah. When I watch the film, I just understand everything because it's really dense. It's Curtis yeah. Hanson, great director, and sadly he's no longer with us, but. Uh, a brilliant, brilliant movie, and it's so well written. When I leave the film and, and and step away from it for a couple of days, I've lost how all the plot works because it's mm -hmm. so complex. And I kind of like that being able to revisit it almost like fresh every time. Yeah. And be it sometimes tropes of horror that are too predictable, like you see a close up of something that is going to be used as a weapon later on. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's like hereditary is super clever in many ways, and has like you say such a fresh idea, and like what crowning crowning the devil effectively. Uh, mm. And I thought, wow! And when you understand the film and enjoy, I was like, yeah, this is hitting every button in my brain. I want to, I want to, you know, want to see. Yeah, but yeah, it's uh, I I get really exhausted. When, you know, when you watch a bad film and it's been recommended or something. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh yeah, all too many. Yeah, like the worst, the worst offender, but it's a documentary series, and it was so bad. Was the this is I actually I never normally post anything. I'm really kind of too yeah uh, opinionated on Facebook because I use Facebook and everything for my promotion of the festival. Same, yeah. That's all I ever use it for because my opinion is different from others, and mm -hmm. you know we all do. Even if we you're left leaning, right leaning, whatever it is. I hate the kind of uh, vitriol and the rhetoric that goes towards your own opinion. Yep. So I use it for that. And uh, and it was it was the fucking Cecil Hotel series on Netflix. And it was, some people loved it. And it was about this famous hotel in LA that- Oh yeah, I, I've like, seen it. Like it I've seen it advertised on just, there. Just John, do not watch it. It's so bad. And they go over the same details in all the episodes. And it's a Ugh. really short story, stretched. And I felt, I felt like, yeah, Netflix have taken the piss. The way you've marketed it, they've got great content. They've got Nightcrawl, uh, Nightcrawl, not Nightcrawler. Um, uh, yeah, with uh, Jake Gyllenhaal, right? No, no, the uh, um, the documentary series about that serial killer, Night something, Night Stalker. Oh, Night Stalker. Yeah, okay. that's amazing. And the scale of his the murders and everything is fascinating. Really fascinating. But then they marketed the uh, Cecil Hotel show the same way. But yeah, this is going to be another yeah. great Netflix hit documentary series. And I've, I was so pissed off. I was really pissed off with it. And it's the same thing with horror. You know, like I'm very dubious of Netflix horrors and how they, mm -hmm. even shows that they, they end shows far too early, they extend shows far too long. Yeah. I don't know how they process that. Obviously, it's viewing figures. That's all they ever care about. It's yeah. got to be something. Yeah. Well, and I know the same way. I haven't been able to finish the second season. Like, they did Altered Carbon. Yeah. And I absolutely love that. Like, the Blade Runner aesthetics that went totally through for agree. it. Yeah. And uh, there's another one. It's a full film, and it's evading my mind right now. It had Sasha Baron Cohen in it and a few other guys um, about this trial of uh, oh, this the, group of the five. Chicago... Five the Chicago six, Five, yeah, 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 yeah. Which I was like, I watched through that. I'm like, that was a, excuse me, but fucking brilliant film. I was like, this was great. It got everything in. Yeah. Then I started trying to watch um, a shorter series on uh, had John. It has John Leguizamo. It's about a couple of younger uh, African American boys who get caught in Central Park, and a woman gets raped, and because oh, they were yeah. in the vicinity, yeah, they're yeah. like yeah. going through. And I just got to a point where I'm like. I can't watch this anymore. The amount of lens flaring and just the way that it's shot and the, like, I can see every camera wobble and every I'm like overproduced as well. Yeah. And I'm just like, this is 
like it's just you can pick it up like let's just go through uh but i find that's the thing right now is like when you get business involved in art yeah. right yeah. i think that that it's hard and it's a hard balance right because you need the business to pay for the art mm-hmm. but then you get something like game of thrones which i thought had four great seasons and then uh, uh-huh. two more seasons that were stretched over like three and a half yeah. to four i'm just like okay like let's do something more with it whereas something like the witcher i'm just like i'm gnawing at the bit to see more of that because i just loved how they did it the cinematography acting henry cavill for me should be in everything oh yeah it's like i I love him to bits and he should be james bond i don't think he will be but i think he should be oh if not how do you get somebody better looking than that more british and he's also a gigantic nerd, which for me yeah, also uh, puts him just over. I've that seen, line. I've seen that, I've seen that video of him putting his PC together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm just like uh, love the man, yeah. and like the respect he had for the material. I got so much time for him, and yeah. you know, you you see uh, some actors that go into projects and they've it's just a paycheck, but that the way he was really in it, and it, it was not bullshit in any way. You know, like you yeah. see a lot of actors that say, "Yeah, I was." I was into the comics years ago. It's the kind of surface information they give that's just passable for kind of Jimmy Kimmel or whatever. And then, yeah. you know, you've got Cavill talking about The Witcher and you know he plays those games. Oh, you know 100%. Does, so. Yeah, I really enjoyed that first season and and like what they did with the uh, the witch and how she transformed in the you know because she was all like you know <sighs> disfigured it. I think it was brilliant and I think the casting the production was great. The one thing I sometimes I get really disappointed with Netflix. This is, I love Netflix, right? I, I was I've yeah. been involved since the DVDs and since before you know the dawn of time. But then when when shows get cancelled early and. I'll give you the, the the finest example for me. I love Stranger Things. We all, we, you know, I think yeah. most of us love Stranger Things. And where the fuck's the next season? You know, where is that? Um, it was the OA. I don't know if you saw the OA, and it's it's a brilliant, brilliant original idea, and it's it's a work of art. Jason Isaacs is an evil bastard in it, and it's about. Oh, it's 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 all it's about religion. It's about all sorts of stuff. And the head of uh, production, uh, uh, a new production at um, Netflix, said she's seen this story arc of five seasons, and she loves it. thinks it's brilliant. And they cancelled it after two. And the oh, end no. of the second season is a masterpiece of cliffhanger. Like, oh my god, cannot wait. Honestly. Yeah. How can you leave something like that, like fucking over Deadwood at HBO? You know, how can you really leave something that's that good? For me, it was it was my favorite show on Netflix, The OA. It was because it can, I don't know what it was about the material. I'm not really, really religious in any way, but the material mm-hmm. in the film really resonated with me so much. And then I was fucking devastated. <laughs> Honestly, I've never oh, been yeah. devastated so much about like, entertainment content as it was for that fit that series and it was it was about this girl that disappears when she's young and she reappears and is is she an angel is she not and and it's about when you die and come back oh it's it's fucking brilliant it's really brilliant I, i'd highly recommend it john it's only this is the thing if you get into it you'll be pissed off at the end of the second season because there's no more of it <laughs> Oh no! Okay, so oh, I'm still gonna go with that because you make it sound absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Um, I know, but I know there's been so many shows where it's like, okay, you're ending on a cliffhanger. Just even, okay, yeah. I get that you're canceling it just for peace of mind for those people. Shoot one episode yeah. more, and they just did like that with um, uh, is it Laura Wachowski? Uh, she did uh, Sense Eight on Netflix, so they did the first season. They did, I think it was a second season. And then it looked like it was being cancelled. They did a Christmas special, which was fucking brilliant because it's about these eight people that are connected. And there's a sex scene in a, in a, in a, in a public stall and it's got all of them involved, these different personalities that are connected all over the world. It's, a, it's, a, it's genius. And then they did um, a two-hour, they finished the show. And I was like, yes, well done, Netflix. You've done the right thing. You've done what... 
HBO did years after with a Deadwood movie. Now you've now you've really done that really well. And I'm like, you've got to do that with the OA, and it doesn't look like it's happening. So you know, when you're passionate about something, and there was there was um, uh, I know this is kind of off topic of filmmaking, but there's there there was a, a memo that was floated around the internet that they were very clear that new content is only going to last a maximum of three seasons, two to three seasons, because they're just hooking everyone in there, you know, spinning plates and they just allow them to drop, yeah. you know, you, cause you see a trailer for something. Oh, that's going to be great. Is it going to, mm-hmm. am I going to invest my time? Because that's what it is. You're investing your time into a show. It's really difficult. isn't yeah. it? Oh, it's incredibly difficult. My other thing is I love the, I don't like waiting. <laughs> I'm like, I'm really impatient. So you really want to hook me into a show. Give me like eight episodes or six episodes, 10 episodes. But the other thing for me is don't give me eight episodes when you've got six episodes worth of material. Give me the six good episodes. I'd rather have six really great quality episodes yeah. than even 12 of something that's, eh, it's not great. And again, I get you've got to fill some stuff in there because of the economics of it. But it always makes me sad that Netflix is almost picking up everything now. And then it's just, okay, then we're just kind of going through. And it's like you say, it's like that shotgun, you know, you know, shoot the shotgun, see what sticks. And even then it's just kind of going, okay, that's, it's just weird. Like I, I find my biggest issue with Netflix is, um, and it's the same thing with a lot of different things now is I just don't know which ones are going to be really good quality uh, out there and which ones are just going to be a waste of my my time, which ones are going to have me, you know, absolutely hooked and going and which ones that are just like, OK, I'm not even going to worry about it. Yeah. But yeah, it's been one of those funny things. Um, nice thing that I've been a- that we've been able to see here because uh, Canadian how do I put it? Canadian film has a certain look and feel to it, has for a long time. Um, Porky's was a massive exception in the 80s <laughs> <laughs> to it. It did not look like a Canadian film. You're like, yeah. okay, it's it looks it looks shitty, but it doesn't yeah. look exactly like Canadian film. Canadian films, if you've ever gone through, and I grew up on a lot of these, they have a certain look and feel. The dubbing's always slightly off, so you're not sure if it was originally filmed in French and then dubbed over or just shot in (laughs) English really poorly. And, you know, the colors are always a little bit yellow and orange, and I'm partially colorblind, and I can tell that they're yellow and orange, that sort of thing. But they're these wonderful, like, great, uh, like, little films that are just there to be there. But we've had a resurgence of, like, Canadian TV shows and things that are coming out from um, the CBC, which is our version of the BBC, uh, and uh, CTV has been funding things. Netflix been funding things, and these are things like you know Trailer Park Boys, uh, Letter Kenny, Kim's Convenience. Just a couple Kim's that are coming to mind. Is amazing. Oh, it! I, I just started that. watching it. I'm literally just through the first season, and there's been times where I'm like, I'm not gonna lie, man. I've like, I've I've had a few tears, man. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah they yeah. leave you laughing and crying. I'm just like, so well acted, it's well shot and just well put together. And so for me to see that type of stuff coming out of Canada right now, uh, it's always been a big thing because previous to that, we were just animation. Like so many Saturday morning cartoons were made in Toronto, or things like Fraggle Rock or, you know, U.S. productions that were shot up here, but to have Canadian made, written, produced, shot, acted content um, has been such a big thing. And I love that about it. But then, as with anything, there's so much junk that then gets kind of shuffled in with it. And so that's where I find, again, difficult to go through with that shotgun approach is like, go for the good ones, like invest the money in them. But at the same rate, like, I'd love to have a shot to make, you know, a, a funded, you know, Netflix film or something like that. I yeah. think we all would. Yeah, there's the films aspect. That's a really tricky thing. And that's, you know, it's never been easy for BBC or CBC or HBO or whoever it is to make a truly great film. Because I feel as though some of that's being held back for cinema and for making real money or that's what they perceive the mm-hmm. But hope you know some of that will change, and for me, the closest thing to a really great movie in terms of action, uh, I really enjoyed Extraction. I think it was Extraction with uh, Chris Hemsworth, 
um, on Netflix. I think it's Extraction. Let me check that. I'll cut this little bit out, but I'm going to check that. Yeah. Um, but the way that was shot and the way I, I thought it was an absolute a brilliant, brilliant action movie. Uh, and I was so surprised. And I really like Chris Hemsworth. Yeah, Extraction. Yeah. yeah. And then yeah. it looks like they're making a sequel to it. And I'm like, yeah, fantastic. Bring it on. But then the quality control uh, bureau of Netflix really fails sometimes. It really does. Mm-hmm. And that's why I'm always fearful, especially films on these streaming platforms, you know. Because you could see what yeah. HBO were doing with this really ugly manoeuvre with Warner Brother content and, you know, Godzilla, what they were going to do, June, which are they going to ruin and not put it in cinemas. And thankfully, these filmmakers that rely on production companies like Warner Brothers to fund their features, especially something epic like June, uh, they came out and just like, yeah, you're not doing this. You're not doing this. Look what Christopher Nolan did uh, with Warner Brothers. He severed his ties with Warner Brothers completely because of how he saw what Warner Brothers were doing with content. And I understand, you know, if they partly own this content, let's put it on the streaming service. Great. I don't mm-hmm. want to see Godzilla versus Kong on anything bigger, anything that I can fit in my house. Do you know, yeah. I, I want to see it. I'm, I, I was so tempted to pay the £15 rental. But I thought, no, I'm going to wait for cinemas to open up on the 17th and I'm going to go fucking watch it in the cinema. Yeah. Oh, I couldn't agree more, man. Like, I'm mixed on that one just because there's a lot of things that I don't necessarily love about going to cinemas uh, with it. But like you say, for something like King, there's certain movies you just need to see on a yeah. massive screen. And something like Godzilla, part of the fun is going with other Godzilla fans to the Godzilla movie at the theater and being able to watch it on a big screen. And everybody's there because it's like, hell yeah, Godzilla. All right, I'm in. Yeah. But that. That being said, like I just I did do the rental on Mortal Kombat that came out for the first You're release. Good. I thought it was really, really good and really well done because they again I felt like they got the material. I feel like Mortal Kombat, it's either they try to take it super serious or che- super cheese ball. I'm like, you've got to realize, yes, it was graphic, but he's literally pull, you know, he'd rip his spine out with the the head type of thing. There's always that like tongue in cheek, cheesy kind of jokey nature to it and i felt like they got it right where they didn't overplay the humor part to it but they didn't eliminate it either kind of like um what ryan reynolds ended up doing with deadpool another Mm -hmm. guy that just got the source material so i enjoyed the hell of it and it was well worth my 25 bucks and plus i didn't have to put on pants i didn't have to wait for certain (laughs) show times i'm like this is fantastic that was that was going to be the one. Mortal Kombat was the one where I was going, yeah, you know what? I'm going to pay for that at home. Godzilla and vs. Kong, I'll actually wait. I'll go to the cinema. Uh, but it's not available for rental here in the UK. It's going to be in cinemas only, it looks like. And there's no oh, wow. rental. So I was really, really pissed off about that. Because I was like, yeah, I saw the opening six minutes, which the production company put online. And it was the the whole thing with uh, uh, Scor- um, Scorp- is it Scorpion or Scorpio, yeah. and the whole thing rivalry with uh, Sub Zero and the, and the start of that. I thought this is, fr-. and we all, I can't remember the, the Japanese actor's name who's in everything. He's fucking awesome to watch on on in cinema, on on film. And I remember the first time I saw him in uh, the Last Samurai with Tom Cruise and Ken Watanabe. That actor's fucking great that plays a, a, a Scorpion. And yeah, yeah, the opening was like, yep, yeah, I'm jazzed for it. I looked online. Uh, not available until the 17th of May in the UK. So fuck. Oh, <laughs> that that person all, sucks. But, you know, I, yeah. I spent money on a really great TV and ready to watch it at home. We've got the sound system. Yeah, let's rock it. Let's really rock it. Yep. Stick the volume up. Uh, I, was, I was really good. <laughs> really good. Uh, dude, uh, being a Canada man, we run through the same thing. It's the number of things that I can't get here are just wild. Like I was shocked, shocked we're getting, you know, Mortal Kombat to be able to watch that here. Like I would have thought you guys would have got it before we would have. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's because all of our networks are so tied in with the U.S. on certain things. Yeah. So if there aren't like dedicated, you know, licensing deals, we don't like there aren't that many issues with it. But again, I would have thought you guys would have for sure had that uh, ability because, I mean, you know, 15, 15 quid, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
it, it's a pretty good payday. And that's oh, the other I, thing too. I would have, I would have, I've done it in a heartbeat. I'd, I've been so happy about that. Oh yeah, I like I said, I loved it. I've got my 5.1 surround sound. Don't have the 4K TV yet, but you know I've got the 1080, and that honestly it suits me just just fine and dandy. Do these things in phases, you know, like my 5.1 systems. Uh, it's around 10 years old. It's called I think it's yeah. a British company called Q Acoustics, and really great speakers. I changed the rear ones to match the wall because I was decorating yeah. the, the small satellite speakers, but. You got to do these things in phases. I only just got oh, yeah. a TV recently and paid over paid over five years interest free for it. Yeah, and you know you you can't have everything at once like camera gear. You mm-hmm. know, like exactly when you're buying a, a Black Magic or uh, some a new Canon camera or new microphones. Like I got a Godox light here, and I didn't get that for years. You know, I really wanted a Godox light and like the copy of the apertures, and I got some smaller apertures in here and. I've got the yeah. um, the accent, the, not the accent bulb, the aperture bulb above me, just behind. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, you can't have everything at once. So when you get that 4K TV, it's going to be amazing. <laughs> oh, it, it'll absolutely be fantastic. I do the yeah. same thing. You know, like my 5.1 surround sound system, I ended up buying used on Kijiji because I just got some guy was like, oh, my girlfriend won't let me have it anymore because it's too loud. I'm like, okay, hell yeah, you know, good mission speakers and things like that. So I'm just like, okay, I'm just going to go for it. And I just find that right now I'd rather take, you know, 500 to a thousand bucks and invest it into new lenses, new gear. I I Um, saw you, I saw your messages on, um, was it your switch? Yeah. I'm selling off. Like I don't play my switch anymore, man. Like I don't have time and I'd rather use that. I'm starting up a, now I'm starting up a live streaming uh, setup as well oh, awesome. uh, to go through. So just investing in, you know, like a laptop and video switcher, that sort of thing. What kind uh, of thing are you going to be, what kind of thing are you going to be streaming? Mainly for it, it's going to be musicians uh, for it. Uh, live acts. Uh, again, my buddy Colin uh, he has this great location. Uh, it's got some very, very cool vibey things. He calls it the Paradise Garage. And people come over and they are like, oh, it's actually in a garage. But it's That's this awesome, great yeah. little thing. So I'm going to partner with him to do uh, some live streaming that way. We're hoping to get some grants. Same thing with Market Hall Performing Arts Center here. We've got a few projects uh, hopefully coming up. Uh, we've got grant applications in. But I was like, okay, you know what? I just got to bite the bullet. And then I was like, okay, I'm not using this stuff. Let me go through. And so I had my streaming set up here. And I'm like, okay, now it's just going to go up a little bit. But again, it's a lot of it is because I have most of the equipment that I I need already it's like three to four grand to just kind of get it up yeah. to where you need it to be what's your kind of what's on the top three things that you you would love to have not necessarily need because i need like a, a boom pole you know i need i need sensible stuff which i don't like buying yeah, but... <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> no. internal storage for my my pc i know yeah. i need a better storage because i've kind of maxed things out through all these festivals yeah so what's your what's on your kind of uh, top three hit list oh that is such a good question for it um i definitely want to go for an h8 uh portable yeah. recorder i've got the h4n awesome. but yeah. That thing is just it's a beast. Oh, it's it's like, a beast. It's yeah. like uh it's like uh it's it's a zoom on st- uh, steroids. Steroids. It's insane. I'm just like, okay, I'll probably never use all the inputs, but I want the option <laughs> to be able to do them. <laughs> for, mu- for music, that would be it's a game changer, it really is. It's oh, like yeah. micro studio, really, isn't it? Well, that's exactly it, because it everything connects through USB. You don't need another audio input for it. The only thing with it, and I would have to look into it, the H4 doesn't do balanced inputs in. So I'm not sure if you'd need something for that or not. But mm-hmm. regardless, um, that would be one of them, just because I love really good quality audio. You know, same thing, like my computer setup, I've got um, two studio quality monitors uh, in my room, my, you know, I've got a mixer board, uh, just for sound in here. Cause it's just very important to me to have really good quality sound. So that's Absolutely. always one of those things. Because yeah. that's something sound is when you start off or when you start doing film sound, a lot of people leave it in the background. Don't yep. they? they leave it, they let it go. When you, yep. when you realize, cause you probably realized this years ago, uh, as well as myself that, if you put the effort in for sound, it elevates your production massively. Yep. Massively. Oh, hugely. It's, it's um, the, fir- 
it's the funniest thing because all the video, if you watch anybody that's been successful in film, first thing they say, most important thing about video is audio. Yeah. Um, tell that to Christopher Nolan and Tenet. Have you seen Tenet? I haven't He's yet, got no. the worst audio mix you have ever seen. And he's no. been asked about it. And the audio at the uh, post-production, he got interviewed about it. And it's happened before. Um, on This is a little bit of a tangent, but on Go, um, uh, Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol, I went to see that in IMAX. And just before that was the first opening scene of uh, The Dark Knight Rises. And it was the original mix of Bane's voice. And if you've not heard it, listen to it on YouTube. You cannot fucking hear what Bane says. You really oh. can't. And he, Christopher Nolan, loved it. And I thought, is there something wrong with this mix? And it's not. And it's only because of that feedback and that shot being released on, on uh, with Ghost Protocol that it got changed. You cannot understand what he's saying. And the same thing happens with Tenet. And he tries to say it's part of the narrative and you, the fact you cannot hear what they're saying, it's not a creative i honestly don't believe it's a creative choice i think it's really poor judgment on the mix because you've got dialogue important and it's the mix is so loud like i like i like loud you know what i mean i love yeah, loud yeah. but seriously it's one of the worst mixed films i've ever heard and i was so surprised i watch it on imax like you and I, we go and see a Christopher Nolan film because it's a yeah. Christopher Nolan film. Oh, yeah. You know, he's equivalent to the next Ridley Scott kind of thing in terms of scale and grandeur and all that. And I was, it was the most disappointed I've been in going to the cinema in years. I came oh. out of that and I thought, I thought the action, the whole thing about going back in, you know, physically, you know, because you've seen the trailer and yeah. I yeah. was like, I, I, I was so close to hating the film. Honestly, I was so surprised. And that's the thing with audio. I, I, I could, I really couldn't forgive the film. And I was really passionate yeah. when, you know, when you, the casual cinema view, you go with them and you get, you and I, we get really passionate about an aspect of a film and they don't yep. understand why you're so angry about it. This, this film costs like $300 million and you can't get the yeah. fucking audio right. Right. Yeah. Well, I was it's... so pissed off. And if you elevate your audio, just to take it back to what we're talking about, if you elevate it, it makes your film sing. You know, it really does. Oh, 100%, man. And it makes all the difference. You know, one of my favorite things is, um, like, again, I, like, I love audio equipment. So for me, you know, a Sennheiser 416 is always going to be uh, high up on my list just because I don't have anything quite that nice in terms of shotgun mics. Yeah. But I wouldn't put that on my wish list. That's going to be something that I'm just going to have to bite the bullet and get eventually. Um, I think Rhodes got one, though, that's uh, now taking over for it. But it's one of those things where it's, you know, one of my first purchases was to make sure I got a good a shotgun microphone. I started with the Zoom, again, like pieces, mm -hmm. but it has yeah. the built-in microphones. It's not... Con completely ideal but for a couple condenser microphones it's a hell of a lot better than anything you're going to get on on camera uh yeah. for it uh same thing with like the m50 when i bought it i got the entire rig with it because it came with a 32 gig sd card where i'm like eh, but you know you can never have too many sd cards but it came with <laughs> yeah. i'm like you know i carry like yeah. 10 around with me at any time but then it also came with a road go mic and i'm like oh, i don't cool. usually record sound in it but it was an extra 50 dollars so i was just like you know what i'm just gonna bite the bullet and put that in there so now i've got better onboard audio but i still would i just know i'd be still be yeah. upset with like, it if i didn't like better onboard audio i i entered the road yeah. my my road reel a couple of years ago and they if you if you're in the first 200 people that submit you get a road video mic pro plus and I'm like, fantastic. And then two weeks after I received mine, a second one arrived. I'm like, I'm not fucking telling anyone. I'm keeping it. So what I do now yeah. is I put this on the end of a, a boom pole. I borrow. Yeah. I need to fucking buy one. And then I just have my wireless go. And, you know, I have a really simple setup. So, yeah, that's for better scratch. Because yeah. there's scratch, which is like you've been talking mm -hmm. about before on board, the little holes in the top of your camera. Uh, and it, yeah, it's you've like you've got to do everything in phases because we're not yeah. made of money, you know. And it's uh -huh. nice to have those dreams of 
Ari Alexis or whatever, but it's, you know, there's there's being sensible about it as well. Like, there's a little cheat here. I've actually got a, a, a Pro Mist here on, on my... I've got the small rig uh, mat box here, right? Yeah. Uh, and I love it a bit, so I'm so happy with it. And if I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wreck my camera angle now. I shouldn't. Oh no! Oh, let, let me do it. Let me do it. So this is a copy of a black Pro Mist, and it cost me twenty uh, three pounds. Seriously, you know, it's a four by four piece of glass. This takes four, yeah. uh, four by four, and four by five point six five uh, filters. Nice. And what I should do is buy the hundred and fifty pound proper Tiffin black Pro Mist, stick it on the lens. And always leave it, and then leave the two filters. But I don't, I don't want to kind of spend that money at the moment. Yeah. So if I just drag this by, you can see, you can see it has the, you see the, see the, yeah, it feels much sharper already. And I like to yeah. take the sharpness out of a lot of my images. And that's 100%. what I, that's what I liked about your film as well is that it because of the haze machine and the black pro mist, it really worked really really well. So you can just what? see, it just takes enough yep. character in it. And yeah, I, I have to prioritize, like we all do, uh, different pieces of gear, you know? Yeah, well, and that's exactly it. Like, And you're exactly right on the Pro Mist. I ended up buying my own Pro Mist uh, for it, but I just went with the one eighth because I didn't want to have it have a huge impact and effect on it, at least to start. But now that I've got the eighth, I want to get the quarter, the half, the <laughs> one, the yeah. two. Like, because you, just let me... is that is that from um, understanding what's happening with with your light now? Because obviously you can yes. see all the YouTube videos in the world, but when you have the piece of gear, then you fully understand what it means to you. So yeah, it's it's can be it's a blessing and a curse when you buy something really great. Yeah, well, and I don't always use it either. Um, just like full admission there, because sometimes I do want it to be a little bit sharp. Uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah, it, yeah, absolutely. But it takes me back to lighting, right? Which is I hate boring lighting, and it's been one of yeah. those things where I'm sorry, like I've seen so many people, and it's just like great, both sides of your face are completely lit, like you don't look terrible, but it's it's boring like, like cor let's have corporate lighting exactly Just, but you did a corporate promo uh fake thing with cat didn't you but it works yep. for that it works it makes complete sense that's exactly it's when you all have about corporate what you're doing. lighting when you um yeah. when you have lighting like the first five seasons of the x-files it's masterful it's masterful well, that's... but when you have something like the newest seasons, which are not shot on film and look like crap, it's it really sours it. And oh, you know? yeah. Well, it's like we were talking about earlier with the lighthouse. Part of the thing about the cinematography is the lighting is so good. The shadows on Willem Dafoe's face and scenes, it's like Willem Dafoe is a brilliant actor. I'll watch oh him in God, anything. anything yeah. But the, sh the way that the shadows just it took him from like a 10 to like a 12 in my opinion, like just that extra little bit of stuff that he couldn't have taken on his own, yeah. but he's already as up as high as he can go. And it's just that little bit of lighting. So I love that. And actually that'd be kind of my next big thing is I want some actual full sized lighting units, as opposed to the led panels that I use now, that yeah. would be one of my other ones. Cause I just, I like that. I like having a harder contrast in a lot of situations where it is. Um, I don't like anything where you're like, you know, you're in the dark and kind of going, but I do like having a fuller framed uh, look to the light. Uh, I do like having it soft as opposed to harsh, but then there's also times where I do want it hard, but it's because of the atmosphere that yeah. I want to create with it. And it's the same thing, whether I'm shooting in something that's really tight and something that's really wide, you know, that, that all comes into play with it. Um so you know, yeah. I totally agree with you because you you understand what the light's doing, and that's why you want all the lighting gear because you kind of yep. need it for different things. You want the different uh, pro mists because you know what's happening with those. I've mm -hmm. actually got I, I've got three older Ari lights in my garage. They're they're mm. smaller units. Yeah, they are so fucking hot. It's ridiculous. Oh. They light when you when you put a um, a soft box on them. It's like it's it it's something else, and it gives you a greater understanding of light when you have something that's older as well. And you know, you mm. start to and like I totally I totally agree with you about the LED panels. I bought this Godox 
SL60W because it was just going to be for my little micro studio thing. And mm-hmm. I've used it for other stuff as well. And yeah, it's, yeah, these things are in phases and, you know, you see people that have got, you know, full Ari lights and all sorts. And, you know, it's, I think it really pushes you to um, get more creative. It really, mm-hmm. really does. Like this second shelf here, that's not lit by anything. That's actually just a few LED, yeah. like really cheap Christmas lights. That oh, just nice. Un- just under that clapperboard. So, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's just about hiding things and little tricks. Mm-hmm. Like I'm, ba- I'm bouncing light from a fixture here up to the white ceiling. And then this is in darkness normally. And, you know, yeah. like when you have these cheap lights and, and set up, it's, uh, I think it's, it's some, it's a, you kind of really cut your teeth. So when you get better equipment, your stuff's like there. There. Yeah, you know, it's like how when I see so I used to play golf quite a lot. When you see someone that's just bought a brand new set of Cobra golf clubs and they have no clue what they're doing, do you know what I mean? It's oh the my same god, thing, yeah, man. yeah. Oh, it's it's a hundred percent. I was talking with a musician friend because I also I have a big passion for musicians. That's why a lot of like the streaming stuff and like music videos, that sort of thing that I really want to do. But I was talking with this uh, musician and she's like, okay, I've done some music videos and I watched one of them. I'm like, this is absolutely garbage. Show me the second one. I'm like, oh, your videographer is actually really good here. She's like, oh, really? I'm like, yeah, you, you see how he played with like the lighting and stuff on your face. Like, yeah, you know, I was, I was thinking about buying the, um, one of the red, uh, kimonos. Is it, uh, Komodo, the, yeah, like yeah. Komodos and they're like, they're the $6,000 camera, but I'm like, you understand that that's a $6,000 body, right? <laughs> and then you yeah. need the lenses, <laughs> which are probably 10 to 25 grand. Then you need memory cards, but you can't just get yeah. memory cards. You have to get, red memory cards what, which are sending that link to that linus tech tips video oh oh god yeah well that's the entire thing i'm like okay what you need to do if you want to shoot your own stuff first use your phone buy some lights you can get them for like two or three hundred bucks now and you've got a full set of three lights you'll get your key light you've got your fill you've even got the background lighting um actually it's interesting originally when i shot night terror i wanted to have a some an image of her walking out the door completely backlit so that she was just in shadow going out to show that you know she's going out kind of hidden didn't end up shooting it through just because of shooting difficulties with it it the the sun ended up kind of overcast so we couldn't get enough light uh with it but that's always something that comes into my mind is i can see some of the shadows i can see where i want lighting to be already and where we can get something that's going to be more interesting as opposed to uh, something that's going to be a little bit more boring honestly and corporate yeah. like you say i i just i don't like boring i think that's yeah. my biggest thing i totally agree with you because when i started with my little setup and this is like i spent time not money but time on sorting this room out and choosing the color and having a very accommodating partner who said, yeah, you can do what you want with the room. Fantastic. I'm going to paint it fucking blue. The carpet is like, is like a purple slash blue because it reminds me of the cinema. So there's all these little things. And I was always pointing to this wall with my camera, uh, which you have seen on previous content. I thought, no, I didn't want, I'm not going down a YouTube route, but I wanted to look how I want it to look, you know, and spend the time with the practical lights and, sticking things up on the wall and all that and you know i want to enjoy the process as well i don't want to ever to have to think it's a chore and and i've enjoyed lighting in the last few years more and more yep. understanding it and practice i think practice is key with lighting especially oh it's massive and that's the other thing um so jamie oxenham is a local uh, filmmaker here mm-hmm. uh, his eye for lighting is fantastic he's very if you just looked at him work, you'd be like, okay, he's very meticulous on what he does. But some people might think that's a little anal retentive. I'm like, no, but everything he shoots looks so good because of how well he lights everything. I love working with him just to learn a little bit more because like you say, it's that learning experience and it's not always from me doing the lighting, but it's seeing how he's doing it and then going, okay, I really like this aspect of it. So I'm going to take that. Didn't like this aspect. So I'm just going to leave that out but now I'm going to add something else to this and just kind of try to 
just twist it a little bit and make it my yeah. own. That's very true, man. I, I kind of, and if you can enjoy something that's really complicated to do, it's uh, you, you're on onto a good thing. Um, I'm gonna, we're gonna kind of end it here. Uh, I could speak to you for hours, man. I'm, I'm really I know, same happy. here. And it's it's so simple to do. I've got a little dog that's gonna be screaming to go for a poo in a sec as well. So, <laughs> so that's my little dog Frida. She's just through that door. Um, but yeah, it's uh, an absolute uh, pleasure to talk to you, John. Finally, uh, sorry to kind yeah. of the emails and all of that, uh, Gmail, Hotmail nonsense, and all that. So, uh, yeah, and um, you may you may know this about Hellbound that's coming up in October. We're definitely doing Hellbound again. Um, and yeah, the um, the amount of admin for festivals is is mental. It's absolutely mental. Um, I can believe but, it. Um, depending on work, uh, I've had it confirmed. You know, obviously. The judges might change, but uh, we've got the chap. Um, oh my god, his name's I'm gonna put his name up on text now. The uh, Jeffrey Reddick, I think it's Jeffrey Reddick, he created the Final Destination uh franchise. He's gonna oh, really, be, he's gonna be one of our judges. He wrote the first film and produced some of the others. Uh, and he worked with Glenn Morgan and James Wong, who wrote some of the best episodes of the X Files. Uh, so he's gonna be one of our head judges for Hellbound Horror Festival this year. Uh, because we were we were except we were blessed, we were blessed last year with Alex Proyas and the legendary uh, Joe Alves, who produced the you know, production designer of Jaws uh, and Close Encounters. So we got the, I got it was dreamland for me. I got to speak to all of them. And when Alex Proyas sends you a script and says, Oh, can you can you, would you approve this for the video we're going to produce for the, the live event? It's like he's sending me a script. You wrote, you know, The Crow and Dark yeah. City. And so yeah, so yeah, it's been we've been really lucky. And this year for Isolation Film Festival, we've got Akiko Sternberger, who's designed some. She's in a she is a genius when it comes to um, uh, unique poster design. She she designed uh, Bryce Dallas Howard's production company logo. She and she worked super closely with her. So she's a great judge. We've got Garth to Bruno Austin, who's a documentary filmmaker from South Africa. And he's just finished DPing uh, a documentary about um, uh, poaching called The Last Horns of Africa, which is looks amazing. I'm dying to see that. And then we've got Michael Chan and Jessica Chan from talking with a mouthful as our judges. Because I wanted to kind amazing. of I wanted different aspects and you know those guys. And there's never I'm I'm really open-minded when it comes to people knowing people that are part of the festival. So there's never yeah. there's never a weirdness, people don't get films don't get judged differently because uh, i know you and michael know each other but that's never a problem for me because it's it, Good. it's it's my festival in the end you know what i mean so and it's <laughs> it's all it's all a lot of fun so yeah um i think i mentioned it the other day we've got at least three or four um awards we're gonna have best film we're gonna have best performance because there's been some great perform uh, performances possibly best animation we've had a Two or three that have been really, really fucking good. Uh, one, one from Japan that that's excellent. The uh, uh, Odina. It's we 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 put a clip in uh, uh, recently, and then we've just had uh, a stop motion that looks fucking unreal. And they had to get authorization to make sure they could release it because it's actually yeah. rentable in certain countries. So we had to get clearance for that. So yeah, we've been really lucky, and uh, I really enjoyed Night Terror Man. And oh. I think you did a great job. And I think I've not seen too much of what you've done before, but I think I feel as though you're happy enough and you're, you see it as a stepping stone and you're always improving. Would you say that's fair? Oh, absolutely. More than fair. I'm always striving for that. I always look for uh, constructive criticism as well. Uh, you know, I don't feel like filmmaking is a me process. It's a we process. Absolutely. So you need to get that thing in because i'll take something one way you might take it completely another way my hope is that if you take it another way you're still loving it or getting something out of it um i put myself into my films for that but i think it's more important whatever you take out of it you know i don't care if you take out a different meaning from what i intended if it means something to you man my job is like made um and yeah. it's been an absolute like just blessing i'm so spoiled to get to 
you know, work with you on this. And, uh, you know, I really appreciate getting into the, the festival as well. So thank you for doing that and putting all of this together. Um, and I think you have a great, great judging panel. Um, and, but that's the big thing is always looking to improve and get feedback and go through. It doesn't mean that I take, I always listen to all the feedback. I take yeah, it in absolutely, yeah. and you know, you, you, my dad always put it this way, take it all in, chew it up and you swallow the meat and you spit out the bones. You yeah. take the good stuff in <laughs> and you get rid of some of the others. Um, and yeah. night terror was a perfect example of that. So, uh, and again, the, just your support has meant uh, an immense amount, my friend. Uh, absolutely. And yeah, I, I see us being great friends in the future as well. Uh, as, oh, me too. Uh, and yeah, I think night terrors, I really enjoyed it. I think, I've, there's so there's so many so many aspects to it. I think the cinematography and uh, I, I think it was really really nice. And I like how you kind of approached me about it through Facebook as well in terms of uh, wanting feedback on certain aspects because you can be really as a filmmaker we can be really closed minded. This is what we want. Mm-hmm. This is my vision, and not being open to anything else unless you're oh, Stan- unless you're Stanley Kubrick. <laughs> you know Stanley Kubrick had yeah. a group of people he worked with. And he's the master, you know. So, mm-hmm. oh, of course he is. If you don't, yeah. And for me, he's his. My respect for him is just going through that for the last few years as I get older. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that we can talk about that uh, until the cows come home, you know. And yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to have you involved in um, the podcast. I'm going to kind of mature and work out uh, for Hellbound as well. And that's going to be more about talking about a single individual horror film, and then kind of going off on tangents as well so yeah I'll, awesome. uh, I'll definitely be keeping in touch john and um i look forward to showcasing your film and yeah i'll put i'll put it alongside some sort of duck animation or something <laughs> hey man whatever's gonna work with man i'm excited yeah. like i'm excited to see this duck animation i'm excited yeah. to see all these films man and uh yeah just let me know if you just want to like shoot the shit one night too man Abs- like- absolutely 100 percent, mate and uh i'm always open to having a chat or if, if you need to talk about something, I'm, I'm kind of all ears. Um, hey, I appreciate you, yeah, man. And uh, yeah, uh, any friend of Michael Chan or uh, Katz is a friend of mine. So uh, yeah, it's great. You've got so, there's such a great kind of community that I've sensed from mm-hmm. you and on Facebook and it's really wonderful. And it, 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 it just enhances creativity and um, yeah, it's just a wonderful thing on yeah. Well, and that's the entire thing. And we feed off of each other. Like I, you need those people around you. I don't know about you. I've been around people that are just not creative and it drains me. Whereas when I'm with creative people, even if it's like, you know, musicians or different artists, I I just, it recharges me again. It's that wind in the sails, much like, you know, talking to yourself. Like I'm jazzed. I'm like, man, if I didn't have something to do after this, I want to go shoot a film right now. I want to go write something down, you know? Yeah. Like I'm trying to, I'm trying to fit any kind of narrative so I can shoot anamorphic, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly, right. <laughs> any reason, um, yeah. Like I'll get my, know, I'll get my camera out tomorrow. Take this camera off this and change the rig. Oh, yeah. that's a, that's a whole thing. We'll do an episode on changing rigs and all. Oh that God. And, and fucking yeah. nuts, nuts and bolts and plates and all sorts. Um, but yeah, uh, I'll, I'll just like take Frida outside. Like tomorrow, I'm just like right. I need to shoot something. I, I have this. I have this the need for speed you know what i mean yeah oh 100 percent. like tom cruise puts in days of thunder I have the, no that's top gun isn't it i have the need yeah. for speed man speed really, yeah exactly uh but john it's been an absolute pleasure my friend and um yeah this is gonna be fun and uh, i think this will probably go out i don't think i want to put it out uh, maybe maybe the middle of next week maybe the end of next week i think friday next week probably uh for awesome this episode and yeah, I, I, have to, I just have to wait for Zoom to compress the video now. <laughs> yeah, oh, 100%, Alex. I know how that one goes. Yeah. It's like, okay, now I just have to sit around and wait. And that's, I always find that's the hardest part. But. Yeah, I, uh, I, turned off, I turned off my computer when I was interviewing. Like, uh, I'd finished with Michael. Michael Chan was on the interview yeah. with Jeffrey Reddick with me. And I turned my computer off and it hadn't finished compressing the video. Oh, and no. I... I yeah, my soul dropped out of my. I'm going to say this: that my soul dropped out of my asshole at that point. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, and thankfully there was this weird thing where it's already compressed. It's already somewhere within Zoom, 
and then you have to recompress and convert the file and change the file extension and all that. So, yeah, there's some, oh, me- some alchemy going on, you know. <laughs> yeah. Because we all, that's another thing. We'll, we'll do an episode just on compression. Oh, man, you compression I mean? and then like <laughs> color and everything. Oh, my God. Yeah. There's so many different things. Yeah. And I just, it drives me nuts having to like convert file formats and then get all the compression right. It's just like, there's times where I'm just like, that can make me want to cry. When you finish a good edit, you're like, I think this looks good. And then you go to like compress everything down. And you're like, oh, a little bit of artifacting or just something yeah. else. Oh my like, God, that's the uh, worst. Artifacting. And yeah, like the videos I put out with this setup and I put out, great. This is the monitor I use for color. This is the this yeah. is the 4K screen I use for uh, the size of the screen. Yeah. And then I look at it on my phone. Fucking hell, because of the, the contrast in the iPhone, why... This disappears a bit. Yes. Like, why the fuck? And oh, yeah. Yeah, trying to cater to many masters is ridiculous, isn't it? Oh my god! It, and I know what you mean. Losing detail. You go to like watch on the phone. You're like, you know, it doesn't look this shitty when I put it up on a screen. Yeah. But everyone needs to come to my house and watch it on this screen. That's what I need to happen. <laughs> you know. Uh, but yeah, yeah uh, it's been an absolute pleasure, John. And um, yeah, we'll definitely be chatting soon. And. I might even send you ideas about stuff we can work on in terms of uh, podcasting and stuff. So, Hey, I love it, brother. Like, and again, thank you so much for having me. And I can't tell you how delighted and what a privilege this has been, Alex. So yeah. thanks uh, one, again, brother. One, one last little comment. I think the, uh, the cat, it looks like Castle Grayskull from He-Man. I love that. <laughs> so, yeah. love I know. That, I, yeah. I, I'm not going to lie. That was a little bit of the inspiration. I'm like, I kind of <laughs> like that type of aesthetic and I'm like, the dark yeah. gray or the light gray? I'm like, no, he's getting dark gray. So yeah, <laughs> that's also like like that castle from um a dark crystal as well. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, all those ones. It's like, oh man, that has me. I wonder if I could use that as a model for like a villain's hideout at some oh, point. Yeah, and then absolutely, just like yeah. mess with you, it a little bit you with put some, some green, you put some green screen in those openings, you're sorted then, aren't you? Yeah. Oh, that would be actually that would be hilarious, but do it in a way that you can actually see it. Oh, yeah. Anyways. Get, that, get that haze machine out, man. Get that haze machine out. <laughs> anyway, 100%. Dude. I'll see you right. soon, mate. All right. Take it Talk easy. Talk to you soon, boss. Bye Have now. Bye bye.